Instead of all to blame And march the streets of Birmingham In a freedom march today Hello, my name is Kendall Dara and I'm a reference librarian at the Library of Michigan, the State Library of the State of Michigan. I'm here today to talk with you about Detroit's Broadside Press, a Black publisher of Black poets. Before we get into the presentation very deeply, I'd like to give you some of my goals for this. Um, first of all, I'd like you to feel some Michigan pride. Important things are happening here and have been for a long time. I'd also like to help promote the interest uh, in black poetry and authors. Um, many of the authors I'm going to talk about today and who were published by Broadside Press are um, well known in um, college literature classes, but not always outside of those. I'd like you to know more about them today. I'd also like to help foster awareness of black history and culture. Uh, they're integral in the poetry that we're going to be looking at today and the poetry that was published by Broadside Press. And I'd like you to become more aware of, hear more voices in new ways. Before we talk a lot about Broadside Press, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Library of Michigan. It's an institution created by the state of Michigan to collect, preserve, and provide access to the story of the state and to support libraries in their role as essential community anchors. Since 1828, during Michigan Territorial Days, the Library of Michigan has served the state government and the people of Michigan, much as the Library of Congress works at the federal level. We have many collections at the Library of Michigan. I'd like to highlight a few of the main ones. Uh, the Michigan Documents Collection is all things that are published by the state of Michigan. The Michigan Collection, I think I like to refer to as all things Michigan. These are books and other materials that are published about the state, but not by the state. So regular book publishers, self-published materials, all kinds of things that cover every possible aspect of Michigan. We have a very fine law library with a law trained staff. Um, there's a general research and collection um, that covers all sorts of topics that is intended to help um, support the research of the legislature. And our federal documents collection contains materials that are published by the US government. We also have a very fine rare book collection that has a number of interesting subsets. Today's program um, is going to focus on one section of the Michigan collection, and those are all materials that are either created by Broadside Press or about Broadside Press. These, this collection um, of materials is all in the Michigan collection, so that All Things Michigan collection. And it contains the broadsides that were published by Broadside Press, and we'll talk some more about what those are. Poetry collections that were published by Broadside Press, directories of poets from, from Broadside, literary criticism that was published by Broadside, histories crit and criticism about Broadside poetry and authors, and biographies of Dudley Randall, who was the founder and lifeblood of Broadside Press. If you saw Amanda Gorman's amazing recitation of her poem, The Hill We Climb at the inauguration in January, or the chorus of captains at the Super Bowl, you already have a good introduction to this presentation. Her poetry, as well as her performances of it, carry on the legacy of black poetry that Dudley Randall published through his broadside press. As with any topic, we can only scratch the surface in this brief presentation. 
I hope this session would be a springboard springboard for you to learn more and explore more. Dudley Randall is our main character. He was born in 1914 in Washington, D.C. And the entire story of Broadside Press revolves around this one man. Uh, Randall was a poet himself who um, had a hard time finding places to publish his poetry and therefore also to protect his copyright. Broadside Press started out of out as a simple practical $12 investment in protecting his intellectual property. It ended up being one of the most important hubs of the black arts movement of the 1960s and 70s and the most important hub of black poetry of the time. But we still have to go back to the beginning. Dudley Randall was born in 1914, the year World War I started in Washington, D.C. That's a long time ago. He was the child of a well, well educated parents. His father was a preacher and his mother was a t school teacher. And like over a million other black Americans at the time, they moved a lot looking for opportunities for decent work, work that was equivalent to their skill set or appropriate for their skill set. They were looking for decent schools. They were looking for decent places to live. They were looking for places that didn't force them to live in poverty. After a number of stops on the way, the Randalls came to Detroit in 1921. Detroit was still a hard place to thrive, especially for Randall's father, who was unable to find work as an educated black man and eventually took a position as a common laborer at Ford's, earning roughly half of what the white workers earned doing the same job there. Racism exhibited by the Detroit police, as well as the Klan activity at the, in the city, encouraged racial consciousness among black residents of Detroit. Black churches, community organizations, newspapers, Greek organizations, businesses and social clubs were all part of the experience of black residents of the city. Dudley Randall was writing poetry already when he and his family lived in Washington. That's when he was only about four. When he was 13, his first published poems appeared in the Detroit Free Press and he had earned a dollar for it as a prize in a youth poetry contest. Later, much later, in 1975, Randall wrote in a capsule course in black poetry writing, poets write because they must, because they have an inner drive. Whether or not anyone hears of them, whether or not they make a scent, whether or not they affect a single po person, poets write and will continue to write. However, although Randall completed high school early at 16, it took many years before he had the opportunity to complete his education, become a librarian, and begin to publish his own poetry. Two years after high school, he found full-time work at Ford Motor Company in the foundry in Dearborn, and then later at the Ford uh, plant in River Rouge. If you've ever been to either of those plants, they were hot, dirty, sweaty work. He was lucky to have work during the Depression as most black workers were the last hired and the first fired. However, in 1937, Randall was laid off from Ford's and did find work at the U.S. Post Office in Detroit. Later, World War II changed much for Randall. He was drafted and inducted into the Army in 1943, served in the South Pacific. During all these years, he was writing poetry, which stayed unpublished in his notebooks. After the war, Randall was able to return to the post office as well as enter the undergraduate English program at Wayne State University with the support from, from the GI Bill. While at Wayne State, he was also he also became involved in student publications and a poetry club. Here, he started making literary contacts as well as developing some of his best known poems. When Randall sought to have any 
poems published, there weren't many opportunities for blacks. One black publication had folded, another ceased to publish poetry. Mainstream, that is white publishing houses, were not interested by then in publishing many black writers. The Harlem Renaissance was over, and so was the money that had gone with it. In 1950, at age 36, Randall continued to keep his work private and continued his education, moving on to the University of Michigan's library school. Because black students off campus were hardly welcome in Ann Arbor at the time, Randall commuted between Detroit and the university. In 1951, he gradu graduated with his master's degree in library science and accepted his first position as a librarian. He worked in a number of different college and university libraries until he took a position in 1956 at the Wayne County Public Library and returned to Detroit. A little earlier in 1952, when Randall was 38, he finally started to see his work published in small magazines. In the winter, 1951-52 issue of Midwest Journal based at Lincoln University where he was working as a librarian. Randall was able to publish two poems he had translated from Russian and one of his best known poems, Booker T and W.E.B. The poem is an imagined conversation between two important black cultural leaders of the previous generation, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois who clearly had different views on how to approach the advancement of black people in the United States. Let's give it a listen. It seems to me, said Booker T, it shows a mighty lot of cheek to study chemistry and Greek when Mr. Charlie needs a hand to hoe the cotton on his land. And when Miss Anne looks for a cook why stick your nose inside a book? I don't agree, said W.E.B. If I should have the drive to seek knowledge of chemistry or Greek, I'll do it. Charles and Miss can look another place for hand or cook. Some men rejoice in skill of hand and some in cultivating land, but there are others who maintain the right to cultivate the brain. It seems to me, said Booker T, that all you folks have missed the boat who shout about the right to vote and spend vain days and sleepless nights in uproar over civil rights. Just keep your mouths shut, do not grouse, but work and save and buy a house. I don't agree, said W.E.B. For what can property avail if dignity and justice fail, unless you help to make the laws, they'll steal your house with trumped up claws. A rope's as tight, a fire as hot, no matter how much cash you've got. Speak soft and try your little plan, but as for me, I'll be a man. It seems to me, said Booker T, I don't agree said W.E.B. We get a look at the frustrations Randall and many other black intellectuals had inside and outside of the black communities. Hard to get published to a broad audience and work that was not always seen as useful. In this poem, Booker T. Washington promotes hard physical work and assimilation into existing capitalistic society. W.E.B. Du Bois, however, defends the value of intellectual life as the path to transforming society. For Randall, this poem expressed the reality he saw his parents live and that he lived as well. Although Randall had managed to get a few of his poems published, small journals and papers with small audiences were not what Randall aspired for, both for his own poetry as well as for the work of other black writers. Randall expressed some of his frustration in black poet, white critic. A, white, a critic advises not to write on controversial subjects like freedom or murder, 
but to treat universal themes and timeless symbols like the white unicorn, a white unicorn. Randall had written many poems that he was sure were worth publishing, but had not yet found a publisher for them. Additionally, as a trained librarian, Randall knew the value of protecting his copyright, even to pass his notebooks around or to perform his work, which Detroit poets were doing regularly in small groups, could lead to, to the theft of his intellectual property. He decided to deal with the matter himself. Broadside Press began without capital from the $12 I took out of my paycheck to pay for the first broadside and has grown by hunches, intuitions, trial, and error. Broadside Press's first publication was Randall's poem, The Ballad of Birmingham. This poem memorializes the bombing on September 15, 1963 of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama a church with a predominantly black congregation that had served as the meeting place for many civil rights leaders and bitterly contrasts it with the apparently far greater danger of allowing children to participate in the civil rights children's crusade that had happened that spring. According to Randall, folk singer Jerry Moore of New York had set it to music and wanted to protect the rights to the poem by getting it copyrighted. Learning that a leaflet could be copyrighted, I published it as a broadside, a single sheet with just the poem on one side in 1965. The poem is one of Randall's most read and performed and is often selected by students for, who participate in the Poetry Out Loud competitions. Here's an outstanding performance of the poem a few years ago by a high school student while you listen to this black student's performance, I'd like you to think about the difference that you hear, the way the poem's performed, and not just reading it. Also think about how the Ballad of Birmingham sounded in the song you heard at the beginning of this presentation. Notice also, maybe the more subtle differences of having a skilled black performer do this poem than my reading of Randall's quotes and his poem, Black Poet, White Critic. Ballad of Birmingham by Dudley Randall. On the bombing of a church in Birmingham, Alabama, 1963. Mother, may I go downtown instead of out to play and march the streets of Birmingham in a freedom march today? No, baby, no, you may not go. For the dogs are fierce and wild. And clubs and hoses, guns and jails aren't good for a little child. But mother, I won't be alone. Other children will go with me and march the streets of Birmingham to make our country free. No, baby, no, you may not go. For I fear those guns will fire but you may go to church instead and sing in the children's choir. She has combed and brushed her night dark hair and bathed rose petal sweet and drawn white gloves on her small brown hands and white shoes on her feet. The mother smiled to know her child was in the sacred place, but that smile was the last smile to come upon her face. For when she heard the explosions, her eyes grew wet and wild. She raced through the streets of Birmingham, calling for her child. She clawed through bits of glass and brick, then lifted out a shoe. Oh, here's the shoe my baby wore. But baby, where are you? Once Randall had published his first two broadsides, Ballad of Birmingham and Booker T and W.E.B., he had some decisions to make. When describing the development of broadside press, he spoke of hunches, 
trial and error. Whose work to publish? Only his own? Randall's first intention was to publish famous, familiar poems in an attractive format so that people could buy their favorite poems in a form worth treasuring at affordable prices. Advice from a reviewer in Small Press Review suggested Randall could serve better serve contemporary poetry by publishing previously unpublished poems. In the end, Randall did both. In this slide, we some, see some of the earliest broadside poems from an exhibit three years ago at the Library of Michigan. In addition to Randall's work, we see work of Robert Hayden, Margaret Walker, M.B. Tolson, Gwendolyn Brooks, Leroy Jones, who changed his name to Amiri Baraka, Julia Fields, and Naomi Long Magid. Soon, Randall would be publishing an anthology of poetry written in memory of Malcolm X from poets well known and poets not known. He had made his choice, published just about everybody. In Melba Boyce's biography of Randall, Wrestling with the Muse, she quoted Betty DeRamis from the Detroit News. Broadside press was bigger in terms of impact than just the specific books. As an independent press that was successful but small compared to mainstream publishers, it opened up the literary canon and mainstream publishing began publishing poetry and black writers and other minority writers. It changed the whole character of American literature. Eventually, Randall published some of the best known black poets whose work has made it into the mainstream. Gwendolyn Brooks, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Etheridge Knight, Don Lee, who later was called Haki Matabuti, Alice Walker, Audre Lorde, Amiri Baraka, and many, many other poets whose work is equally excellent, but whose names are not well known at least to white audiences outside of university literature classes. By 1995, Dudley Randall's Broadside Press was responsible for publishing over 400 African-American poets, 101 books, 94 broadsides, five posters, and 27 tapes and albums of poetry. And this pic these pictures come from an exhibit we did at the Library of Michigan a few years ago. Just to give you an idea, the enormous volume, and this is not everything, that came out of Broadside Press. While Randall taught briefly at the University of Michigan, he and Robert Hayden were asked by the chairman of the English department to compile a small collection of black poetry because students had pointed out that the anthologies used in the intro to poetry courses contained no black poets. Um, originally, Randall finished the, the project and produced a book booklet of 48 pages with 25 poets. He continued to work on that anthology for many years. And eventually that little anthology involved evolved into a paperback that became the standard textbook for college classes that included black poetry, the black poets, which contained 45 poets, known poets, plus folk songs and spirituals with no identifiable author. In some ways, this little anthology summarizes Randall's life work. It also brought black poetry into the hands of college students in all sorts of classes and into the mainstream. There are a few important things to notice about black poetry after 1960. Some hallmarks. Um, the new poetic structures. In Randall's poems, you often see more traditional forms uh, with rhyme and meter that we're used to. Um, in the, the younger poets, you will see completely new and different um, experimental structures or just structures at all. It's very different and it serves the purpose of the author. You also see vernacular language based on everyday black speech, vocabulary, cadence, intonation, everything that makes black speech black. These authors were writing with their own authentic voices. 
It's also performative in nature. Um, lots of the poets were performing their own work in small and large groups, and many of them still do. Um, and mu much of it is best when you hear it. Um, some, some authors uh, perform their work exceptionally well, and I encourage you to take a look for some of them on YouTube. Sonia Sanchez and uh, Haki Matabuti, uh, Nikki Giovanni, Gwendolyn Brooks, all have performances that are available on YouTube and they're amazing. Also, black poetry is immediate. This often feels like the poem is in your face. The reader doesn't need a classical education to understand these poems, although there's often references to people and events that are important to the meaning and you need to look them up. But those are things that are like ripped from the headlines. They are not esoteric or hard to find. They're things that you'll find with just minimal research. And these poems finally are unconcerned with a non-black audience. Black poets are no longer, no longer need to please white critics or publishers. As with any poetry, anyone is welcome to listen and learn, but don't expect these authors to explain a thing in their poems. Sometimes you just have to do some research. There's some common themes too that you'll see in black poetry. I'm borrowing an, uh, borrowing and augmenting poet Kevin Young's list from the African American Poetry Project, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Uh, first of all, the freedom struggle, you will see this in all sorts of shapes and forms. Uh, Kevin Young observes that for African Americans, the very act of composing poetry provided a form of po protest, and you will see it the more of this po poetry you read. Black identities, uh, and self-assertion and self-protection. African-American poets have asserted their blackness with joy, with defiance, occasionally with bitterness at the pressure to downplay black identity or hide it behind a protective mask. Black experience in history and memory. The past has been both a subject and a muse for African-American poets who have lamented the foundational trauma of slavery and its legacy, even as they've celebrated the spirit of endurance, resistance, and grace that has become central to American identity. Black language and music. Black poetry has deep kinship with performance, music, black preaching and code switching between forms of language and speech. And family and community. Ties to, of family and community are a perennial subject for this poetry. To Kevin Young's list, I want to add particularly a particularly strong theme in broadside poetry, the role of the black writer and poet. Dudley Randall, um, in his introduction to the Black Poets wrote, the best of them have absorbed the techniques of the masters, have rejected them, and have gone in new directions. Perhaps this direction, perhaps this rejection has its roots in the movement of the 50s and 60s, when poets saw the contorted faces of mobs, saw officers of the law commit murder, and respectable people scheme to break the law. There was no cry for law and order then. Perhaps they asked themselves, why should we seek to be integrated with such a society? This alienation from white society initiated and turning away from its values in poetry. Poets turned to the poetry of folk, of the folk, of the street, to jazz musicians, to the language of black people for their models. This emancipation from white literary models and critics freed them to create their create a new black poetry of their own. I want to show you an example of history and memory in black poetry. Uh, we see this now a lot in the headlines when you see the hashtag say her name. That's a good example. Black Lives Matter often lists names and events that are 
important reminders of what's going on, what's been going on recently and in the farther past. And events and names appear frequently in broadside poems. They're references that are important to understand so that you can understand the poems, just as the historical and cultural references are in historic poetry. While the poetry is immediate, you need to find out the background to understand the purpose and the meaning of the poem. Um, I'd like you to take a look at the poem on the screen to Darnell and Johnny, February 23rd, 1973. Owen Darnell Winfield, born May 22nd, 1943, and John Percy Boyd Jr., born January 2nd, 1949, were assassinated by an agent of the state while struggling for black liberation. Africa will rise. This is a, a clear reference to current recent events. And I'd like you to notice too that the author, Melba Joyce Boyd, she's the sister and a uh, half sister of these two men. So she she was clearly affected by their deaths and she continued to be uh, developed as a poet and ma made an entire career out of poetry and academic life. So we have an article from the Michigan Chronicle, which was a black newspaper that uh, was pretty important in the Detroit area, but also around Michigan and asked the question, was John Percy Boyd set up and discusses that the FBI had been involved with the family and following the family and some of the very different kind of perspective that you might see um, between a family member like Melba Boyd and um, what you might see in the other newspapers from the area. And I can't think of another poet than uh, Etheridge Knight, who more clearly exhibits in his work the role and responsibility of poets, black poets and writers. Broadside Press published many poems about the danger of black intellectual life as well as the responsibility of writers to continue to do this dangerous work. Etheridge Knight does it powerfully in the poem for black poets who think of suicide and the two high school students that perform it do a magnificent job. I'm Jensen. I'm Alex. And our classic is for black poets who think of suicide by Etheridge Knight. Black poets should live not leap from steel bridges. Like the white boys do. Black, Black poets, poets should live, live, not lay their necks on railroad tracks. Like the white boys do. Black, Black poets, poets should seek, but not search too much. In sweet, dark caves, they'll hunt for snipe down psychic trails. Like the white boys do. For Black, Black poets, poets belong to Black people, are the flutes of Black lovers, are the organs of Black sorrows, are the trumpets of Black warriors. Let all Black poets die as trumpets and be buried in the dust of marching feet. The mark Dudley Randall made through Broadside Press on the landscape of American literature has been valuable and enduring. Um, the heyday of Broadside was the 1960s and 70s. By 1977, Dudley Randall had some serious health problems that forced him to sell Broadside Press. Um, the the work was grueling and he just couldn't do it on his own anymore but by 1982 he was feeling better in a better place and managed to resume ownership of the press but a few years later in 1985 he retired and sold the press to hilda and don vest from 1985 until the present, Broadside Press has continued to publish on a small scale and promote black poets. The organization of the press, press's business has changed some um, and it's now run by a board. In, uh, in 2015, it merged with Lotus Press, which needs its own presentation. Lotus was another small black 
Poetry Press in Detroit, and we need to cover that another time. In 2000, Dudley Randall died. Broadside Lotus Press continues to promote and publish Black poetry and promote and organize events related to poetry. One of the biggest annual accomplishments is the Naomi Long Magic Poetry Award. The current year submissions are due March 25th and guidelines are available on the Broadside Lotus Press website. I used four videos in this um, presentation and you can look those up on YouTube. The information is available on this slide. I also used a number of books and would like to make the titles available to you. Um, and also just to, if you'd like to read more about Broadside and read the poetry, these are some concise pieces that um, you could get a hold of. Um, there's a lot more. Um, the individual books published by Broadside as well as the Broadsides themselves are available at the Library of Michigan. But if you want just a few things to get in your hands, these books are great. Um, Roses and Revolutions is an anthology of work by uh, Dudley Randall. Uh, Wrestling with the Muse is his biography by Melba Joyce Boyd. Um, if you are interested in a very thorough history of Dudley Randall, the Black, uh, the Broadside Press, and the Black Arts Movement, um, Julius Thompson's book is super, and it's incredibly detailed. He includes lists of publications, so if you wanted to know everything Broadside published, um, it, it, and if you want to know the background history, especially of Detroit at the time and the U.S. at the time, that book is just fantastic. It's one-stop shopping. Um, there, it's really terrific. And then if you would like to read some uh, great anthologies that contain a lot of broadside poets, um, Gwendolyn Brooks edited a book of broadside poetry years ago that is still great, A Broadside Treasury and Gloria House and others published, um, edited and published um, a different image in 2004 and that's a lovely anthology that includes a CD so you can listen to the editors who are very skilled poets reading the poetry out loud and that it's really a treat. And we have some databases at the Library of Michigan that you can get to through our family history page with your Library of Michigan users card. Um, Black Thought and Culture, um, the Michigan Chronicle uh, from 1936 to 1910, and finally Ethnic News Watch. And these are very useful. I referred to them some for this presentation. The Michigan Chronicle article that I showed came from this. Um, this set. A few really good websites to learn more about Black poetry or specifically Broadside Press. Broadside Lotus Press website is very good and gives a lot of history. You can also see what's going on. You can even buy books of poetry from them. Lift Every Voice, a nationwide celebration of 250 years of African American poetry is going on right now and their website is really terrific. You can learn so much if you just go to that one. And then the Poetry Foundation is not specific to black poets, it's specific to poetry. And that is just a great place to find poems, recordings of poems, information about poets. It's very useful. And how to reach the Library of Michigan. You can write us, you can call us, you can email us, you can check our website. You can get a library card for free from us and you can visit our family history page. Thank you so much for listening and watching along. I, I hope you've learned some neat things about Broadside Press, Black Poetry in Michigan and Dudley Randall, and I hope that you will continue to learn more about them. Thanks. <laughs>